talking about the time of origins, the time of the beginning of this church. And one of the things we need to understand about the Diocese of Dunedin is that there was a tremendous problem at first, with, with, with Bishop Neville's biggest problem of finding clergy of sufficient caliber who would stay, and the problem of paying them. And you'll notice on the, the board out there, a lot of short-stay ministries in the 19th century. In the end, in sheer exasperation, Bishop Neville decided to establish his own theological college to solve the problem, which has left the creation of Selwyn. And the reason why he was able to do that, in a sense, the gender controversy is irrelevant. Bishop Neville was in many ways a very irascible man who fought with his brother bishops, often quarreled with his clergy through the pages of the local newspaper, but he had an ace in the hole. He had married money, and he used this money to get the diocese of the deep going. He built, at his own expense, the Episcopal residence up on Roslyn, uh, and right near, I think, Columbus, and, and he also built Selwyn College. And, and this strategy, on the whole work, there was a higher retention rate of clergy after that. And uh, the only vicar who really stayed any length of time in the 19th century here was Rev. Ronaldson, and it was in his time that the church moved down from its site on South Road to here. The original wooden structure which Bishop Harper consecrated was moved up the hill to become the first St. Mary's Mornington, and that in many ways was a fateful decision because, of course, the soil here is very soft. And uh, when they built the brick structure, uh, there was a great Masonic ritual, since Ronalds was into Masonic, and he was the Grand Master of New Zealand, you can't actually see the, uh, you, you know, the, the kind of um, stone recording that because it's sunk beneath the earth, the, the building's been slowly sinking. And you may recall that when the sanctuary was extended in the 1960s, it began to abruptly sit and had to have several tons of rock deposited under the foundations. You're sitting in the sanctuary, now you see it at a sideways angle, just as the, the west wall is also leading out. Interesting, if there is an earthquake, it will probably fall on the cottage. <laughs> anyway, um, the first vicar we're going to be talking about is the first long stay ministry in the late 19th century, who is, of course, Brian Chang. And he came in 1892 and stayed until 1911. Uh, the real significance of him is that he is the one who established the Anglo-Catholic tradition here. We'll be finding out why that was. Uh, he was uh, ordained in Western Australia. He was the vicar of uh, a parish in Tasmania. And he came to Dunedin because Bishop Neville was always looking for tutors for his new theological college. And so Brian King was at first uh, priest in charge of the Northeast Valley and a tutor at uh, Selwyn. He obviously he wanted to leave the job quite soon afterwards, but was told there was no jobs back in Tasmania. Uh, people tended to have that kind of relationship with Bishop Neville. And he then became the vicar of St. Peter's Parish and had a long stay ministry here. And uh, as we shall be hearing, his father had been also a Brian King and had been the vicar of St. George's in the East. Um, we sort of got there. Uh, uh, and uh, had gone there in 1842, thank you, and um, had immediately introduced a variety of ritual practices, including wearing of Eucharistic vestments and intoning the service. And really, when ritual riots broke out in this parish of St. George's in the East in 1859, this was the beginning of the famous ritual disturbances, the second heroic phase of Anglo Catholicism. Uh, the original Brian King had married one of a, um, two, it was, it was a two, twins of the great beauties, and he had 12 children. And Brian King, the second, was, was one of those 12 children. And um, here we see an um, illustration, kind of, it was a kind of caricature, a cartoon view of what took place at St. George's in the East. Firecrackers were let off in the church, pea shooters were used on the clergy. Uh, <laughs> One person used the um, cues as a water closet. <coughs> Things became so bad that 50 constables had to be drafted in to protect uh, worship there, and various prominent Anglo Catholics came to protect uh, Brian King. Now, um, up until recently, this second heroic phase of the movement has been interpreted as either um, why was all this trouble visited on the movement when they were merely trying to bring a more imaginative approach to worship, 
or otherwise, why was the more patience, diplomacy, and tact used by the workshop innovators to um, uh, moderate all that? But a new book has just come out called Glorious Battle by an American sociologist, John Shelton Reed, which has really transformed our understanding of this period. And he's drawn a parallel between the second generation of Anglo Catholics, the ritualists, and the American youth movement for the 1960s. And his theory is that these people had gone looking for trouble. They, had, they, were picking, they picked a fight because they understood that there's no such thing as bad publicity. And what the effect of this publicity was to attract other enthusiastic young men to the movement, to give an impression of strength beyond the actual uh, numbers of the movement, and to, and to make it establish as the cutting, the revolutionary cutting edge of the Church of England. And so this was the matrix in which Brian King Jr. was formed, and in fact, the vestments of his father are now deposited in Dunedin Cathedral, plus the chalice given by Dr. Edward Hoover in Pusey, one of the great Tractarians, because Brian King, his retirement, was canon of the cathedral and has left those things there. So uh, he left in 1911, and uh, his son uh, was um, Vincent King, and he became the great social worker priest of the diocese. He was licensed to be chaplain to public institutions, which included the jail, the hospital, um, and he started off a, a mission uh, in Filial Street, uh, they took over a hotel. That mission has not survived, and even does not have a city mission now. And uh, he was a very hard-working priest, probably a bit of a driven workaholic, had several major breakdowns. Uh, and um, here's a record of, um, of a typical day in the life of him. And as you say, as you see here, he claimed to deal with this mad woman on the premises but he had a knowledge of jujitsu. And the priest put a client in a judo hold these days to be up on a charge of assault. Uh, but he was, uh, in his own way, quite a remarkable person. And the second Mrs. Neville, um, the first Mrs. Neville died, and he married the daughter of Reverend Fiennes Clinton actually left £2,000 to Vincent King because I actually wanted to see his work continue on. He received the OBE for it and uh, he died in 1945, but one after he retired. Uh, his son, uh, Merrick King, was uh, also ordained, a very emotionally fragile person, never really got going in this ministry and died in 1988, having had quite a variety of um, psychological troubles. It says on his tombstones, buried um, at uh, Broad Bay Cemetery, quotes from Psalm 31, I will rejoice because thou hast taken heed of my adversities. So um, the next vicar is the Reverend Edward Edwards, and the boom years for the churches of New Zealand were the late 19th century and the early 20th century. The Anglican church was felt was kind of things were slipping a bit as the Edwardian era proceeded. And in 1910, the Church of England sent out 16 missioners in the Great Mission of Help, which aimed to have a mission in every parish in New Zealand. And Edwards came down, uh, he'd been ordained in the Diocese of Norwich, having been trained at Lincoln Theological College, had been in Newcastle on time, and he went to the Deep South, didn't come here to run a mission, but he became the vicar of this parish in 1911. And there's a very poignant aspect of this photograph because this is the, the opening of Holy Cross St Kilda, the opening ceremony, and he's deaconing the High Mass for Bishop Neville, he's got a top governor, Chasuble, and the works. What kind of churchmanship do we think Neville had? We think he was a kind of moderate um, high churchman who felt he needed to conceal that at first because of the gender controversy. By this stage he'd become a primate of New Zealand, uh, he was, would have feel, felt very confident in his stride. And of course, Holy Cross and Kilda was closed just a couple of years ago because it's an earthquake risk and is the process, as I understand it now, being sold off. So, as I say, a real poignancy about this time of very hopeful beginnings. Because this parish had, of course, resourced uh, the, beginning, the beginning of all that. The money was there, and Edwards had the final push to get Holy Cross and Kilda going, which at first was a chapel of ease of this parish, an i.e., a mission church, and then in 1917 became a parish in its own right. And I might add, one of the things I'll have to address in the parish history is the constant ambivalence in the relationship between the two parishes. Two vicars, Roger Taylor and John Teal, have both gone on to become vicars of Holy Cross 
Ross and Kilda, but there's been something of a feeling of, you know, a big brother, a little brother, uh, some tension in despite all the crossover points. And Edwards um, was only here for three years. He left in 1914 and went to America, uh, where he became the curate of and then the vicar of St. Luke's, Baltimore, a 1200 congregation Anglo Catholic parish. And he married there a millionaire's daughter. Uh, and they had a wonderful wedding at the great Catholic shrine in New York of um, uh, St. Mary's um, 46th Street with uh, her nephew, uh, Calanche, the Bishop of New York, and the Bishop of Fond du Lac presiding at the nuptial mass. And uh, if you go to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine New York now, the golden doors there were actually given by her father, who was a very generous benefactor of the church. And this remarkable woman was given to mystical visions of Thérèse of Lisieux, of Jesus in the Reserved Sacrament, and uh, her spiritual director, that's uh, a member of the Society of St. John the Evangelist, encouraged her to publish this book. And you would think, well, this is a happy ever after story. He, he's hit the big time. He's in a, a premier parish. He'll stay there forever. Not at all. This priest, Edward Evans, had itchy feet, and he kept moving at regular intervals. He would go on to become um, get chaplaincy in Spain, chaplaincy in Chile, he was made honorary canon of um, the cathedral on, on the Falkland Islands, <coughs> and he finished up in the Diocese of Sonic uh, in World War II, and his church was burned out, we think, as a result of the attentions of the Luftwaffe, and he died in the early 50s in the West Country with quite a small amount of money, and that's the final uh, letter of his will. Here's a point of puzzle. Did his father-in-law lose all his money in the great crash of 29? Was there some kind of falling out between daughter and father? Or did they do the dough in these constant moves all the time? So uh, he was succeeded <coughs> by this priest, uh, Father Mortimer, J.L. Mortimer. You might have read about him in the paper this morning. You know, they're doing, the ODT's doing the thing, 1915. And it was a big... Uh, meeting in one of the public halls to talk about the war effort and the river jail and water said, well, I think you should bring it to construction. Stop all this volunteering stuff and cut to the chase. Since he was so diverted, he wouldn't be going to the war himself. But he was a remarkable priest. Um, this photograph is actually on the wall of the sacristy. I tried to pull it off the wall and it's screwed, been screwed into place. So David school, I was taken with this photograph with his cell phone. Got a lazy eye to see here. And uh, he was a poet. He was very interested in social questions. Uh, published a book on the National Guild Ideal, very interested in Christian socialism, very appropriate he should be here in this parish, one of the advanced industrial revolution suburbs of New Zealand. And um, uh, he's surrounded by service. And I should explain, he was a New Zealander, trained at St. Stephen's House, Oxford, and he came back to New Zealand because of this man, Father Burton who became the Vicar of St. Michael's, who transformed St. Michael's into the premier Anglo-Catholic parish of New Zealand. A barnstorming mission priest, who uh, really sent half, you know, half the parishioners left when he came to St. Michael's, and he filled the church up again with a different variety of parishioners. St. Michael's had been originally the pro-cathedral of Christchurch Diocese. It had been a smart inner city church. Since things were slipping, it wanted to move in a high direction, and my goodness, they got more than they bargained for when they got this priest. <laughs> He, and, and Mortimer married his daughter and came out as part of the change team to be his curate at St. Michael's. And after Burton left, having changed the world, Burton left and the Australian priest Canon Perry came and to face the music of what followed afterwards. And at first, Mortimer was the priest in charge of, St. of East St. Albans, which has now become the parish of Shirley. And I'm sure Bishop Victoria would appreciate the irony of what is now one of the most conservatively evangelical parishes in her diocese had an Anglo-Catholic priest at the very start of it all. Mm -hmm. And um, Mortimer then came um, to St. Peter's. Here we have a remarkable character behind him, I assume, as the master of ceremonies. And of course, Anglo-Catholic parishes thrived on guilds, um, guild and serves the sanctuary and what have you. And some of those young men who surround him, um, one of them would be uh, the Rev became the Reverend Hurd the one whose ashes are now buried at St. Michael's Clyde. And you may you know anything about what's been going on there. St. Michael's Clyde was facing the possibility of closure, and the Hurd family weren't pleased about that, and they have um, got behind things to launch an initiative to turn St. Michael's Clyde into a <coughs> spirituality 
centre. And the reason is because the Reverend Herbert, I don't know which one of these young men he is, uh, who went moved when you know, served to a priest, his ashes are there, because twice the river done still. And um, Mortimer uh, died of tuberculosis in 1920, and his ashes are buried in the cemetery. Uh, now, the important thing about him is interest in social questions, his interest in Christian socialism, is that what initiated the third phase of the movement in some ways was the publication of that collection of essays called the Lux Mundi essay, Light of the World, which in a rather timid way began to face up to the consequences of German biblical criticism, but it only allowed for the Old Testament. It faced up to the consequences of Darwin's theory of evolution, and it also found a place for Christian socialism. Uh, one with said that um, this movement had tried to change the Church of England from the Tory party at prayer to the Socialist Party at Mass. <laughs> anyway, uh, Watermark did grasp that thread of looks from the collection of essays. Um, the early 1920s were a period of considerable instability and turmoil <coughs> here. Two vicars left in rapid succession, one of them had to hand his son license in, and then along comes. Canon Button, who brings in a period of stability through 1925 to 1935. A moderate churchman, but a one who stabilizes the parish and kind of, uh, you know, it had gone high and it had lost it, but now he, he, he saw it through a difficult period. And what we have to understand about the end of war period of the Diocese of Dunedin is that Isaac Richards, who comes in as the new bishop in 1920, faces a considerable problem because when Bishop Neville retired in 1919, all that private money stopped being pumped into the diocese. And in a sense, a structural deficit opened up. The diocese had to start flipping the bill, which you could argue it's never moved away from. Now, Richards was a man who was a man of big ideas, wanted to see major changes, a man of deep spirituality, but he wasn't so good at turning those big ideas into practice. And of course, his Episcopal ministry was bookended at the front end of the back end by a depression of, and that kind of limited ability to make things happen. The clergy became very restless in the situation, and when the next Episcopal election came along, they got together and they decided that the lot would fall on the Reverend Fitchett, Tony Fitchett's grandfather. It was not a man with a particularly charismatic personality, but he was a great <laughs> administrator, he was very good about money, and so they made sure that Fitchett was elected. And Fitchett concentrated on four things making sure that the clergy were properly paid, making sure, if possible, that the clergy were properly accommodated. He understood that clergy wives are the magic ingredient for promoting happiness in vicarage and parish. Uh, trying to make sure there was a resident clergyman wherever there was a significant concentration of population, and finally trying to link the centre with the periphery, trying to communicate all the time to people of Southland and Upper Calutha what the nervous centre was thinking, what it was up to. And out of that, morale began to improve, the clergy began to stay longer in their parishes, there was more of a sense of things moving in the right direction. So when Alan Johnson comes along to be the fourth bishop of Dunedin in 1952, I think it was, the boom years are starting and the baby boom generation get going. <coughs> We're gonna, and we've heard how Roger Taylor, it's a good time for him, and a good time for this parish. And the second great wave of church building begins through this period of the 50s and the early 60s. So Button sees the parish from this difficult time in which Bishop Isaac Richards is struggling. Uh, this is uh, the curate, Alan Jackery, uh, in the foreground, and Archdeacon Tywood's next to him, a short man, another Tasmanian. And um, uh, we heard how he wore a Canterbury cap. Now the significance of this is that there's been two strains of Anglo Catholicism, those who followed what the Western Roman Church has been doing, that sets the model. And those are saying, no, no, that's wrong, we must follow Percy Dermot's lead in the Parsons Handbook and go back to what was going on in the Middle Ages, based around the Serum Rite of Salisbury Cathedral and be authentically English in our tradition, which is why he wore a Canterbury cap. And time was significant for two things. Uh, I'm pretty sure he would have been the one who had established the mission church of St. Albans, of course, have been. He certainly told the parish off and was invited back to preach at an even song one time after they closed it. He rebuked the parish for closing to Dawkins Course to feed. And he's the one who launches St. Barnabas Rest Home. Mm -hmm. A project there was hard for many years, but he couldn't make it happen. And finally, in the 1950s, the New Zealand government thought we need to get the rest home industry underway. We don't want to take responsibility for this ourselves. 
and will offer a pound for pound subsidy to charities, NGOs, and churches to launch rest homes. And that's how St. Barbara's came into existence. Mm -hmm. And Pyle believed in St. Barbara's so much that he actually checked into St. Barbara's and died there himself. <laughs> after a um, and the last person I want to talk about is Roger Taylor. This actually was taken at, again, Holy Cross St. Kilda, which he went to later on. Uh, and we've heard how Roger's remarkable pastoral energy, his remarkable capacity for visiting people and keeping traps on them, uh, his interest in church music and his son in the choir at Christchurch Cathedral really made this place come alive. And, you know, it's been, it's been a, a delight to me to hear about this because I remember him as a retired priest who was not entirely ready to be happy. And it was good to get this, these were good years for him, a happy time for him, the best of years. The 10 years he was here, saw things go very well. We've heard that Roger had a slightly angular personality. When he arrived at Holy Cross and Kilda, he immediately announced, the Church of the Province of New Zealand has recently uh, approved of the remarriage of divorced persons while permitting a conscious let out clause for clergy. And let me tell you, I am one of those clergy. Don't bother asking me to perform a um, marriage for a divorced person. Uh, and I realised unwittingly in the process of this research but I actually knew one of Pyle's sons because he used to work for the South Island Organ Company as a tuner. And he'd come around to St. Mary's Abbey every six months or so to tune up the organ. And he told me with great glee how he and some of his mates who were back from Burnham, and they had a bit of time off, they found uh, Roger, who was a very who was a pacifist, a very brave thing to be a pacifist and make all views known at the start of the Second World War. They picked him up and tossed him on the Avon because he'd been street preaching against the war. And, um, and, and so Roger is significant because he sees through that, the, the glory days of the parish when, to when things were really good for churches. And, and you know, my final thought is this, that one of the intriguing things in the interviews is, to, is that how Blair Robertson's three years here was such a success story and a happy time. He really he launched a final push to build this hall. It was a very... Um, <coughs> Like the social life in the parish. It's an intriguing thought, isn't it? I mean, those nominators, Carl told me, had originally gone to St. John's Rosman, that plan to recruit the vicar of St. John's Rosman, the next vicar of St. Mary's Maribel. But that vicar had just taken a you know, job somewhere else. They said, oh, come on to Cavisham. Supposing that hadn't happened, and supposing Blair had stayed longer, perhaps this would have been this really happy time. Things didn't finish entirely happily for him at St. Mary's in the long run. But then, of course, Father Carl would have come, so clearly, divine providence. <laughs> 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 really glorious here at the start. <laughs> One of the things which hasn't shown up on the interviews, I should say, is that Carl introduced incense every Sunday, so I've been the, the benefactor from all that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The angel of the Lord brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There, water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east. Thank you. 